Okay, welcome everybody to our webinar 2022 recruiting best practices and how to land top talent in 2022 presented by Sentinel Benefits and MP Wired for HR. We have two great speakers today on a very hot topic. Um, to remind everybody for some housekeeping notes, uh, this webinar is being recorded and all attendees will receive this recording afterwards as well as um, an option to view the presentation. Um, please hold questions in the Q&A feature instead of the chat just so we can get to all the questions and if by the end you don't see your question get answered or we don't answer it, you will be followed up with after and we can happily uh, have a further conversation on that. So. Without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague and good friend, Lisa Vassalo, who is a people and culture generalist at Sentinel Benefits, and she will uh, kick things off. Thanks so much, Nick, and hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Um, as Nick mentioned, my name is Lisa Vassalo. I work on the people and culture team at Sentinel Benefits, and I'm really looking forward to being a part of this webinar today with MP, um, specifically Tracy. So just a quick overview of um, MP, and I'll introduce Tracy. MP, as you can see on the slide, is a full service human capital management services company. They offer HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance and compliance services. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Sentinel Benefits and Financial Group, we are a full service employee benefits firm offering everything from retirement plans, um, group insurance, health and welfare administration and financial planning for uh, employers as well as individuals. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Tracy. Tracy is the Talent Solutions Manager at MP. She brings nearly two decades of talent acquisition experience. Prior to joining MP, Tracy served as the Talent Acquisition Lead at Public Partnerships for nine years. She holds a bachelor's degree from St. Michael's College, as well as a PHR license from HRCI. So Tracy, I will kick things over to you to get us started. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Lisa. So today, um, during this webinar, we're going to talk a bit about some different recruiting trends in 2022. We'll get into the great resignation, as everybody is very well aware of, of what that is. Um, we'll also talk about some adaptive actions that employers can take um, as we look at the current landscape. We'll talk about some best practices to ensure remote recruiting success, and also just talk about creating a positive candidate and employer experience throughout the hiring process. We'll also talk about some different ways that companies can optimize their tech stack, especially as we think about um, being in a remote environment. So first, as we look back at 2022, or look back at 2021, um, as we look at 2022 going forward, it's still going to be a candidate market this year. Um, the challenges in reaching candidates to meet demand is going to continue. The turnover will continue to break records. Hiring decisions will need to happen quickly. Benefits are still front and center. And flexibility around work schedules and remote options are, can both be really messy, but also beneficial. So we'll dig in a little bit more just about you know, what that looks like and really just make some recommendations for employers as they look at these different um, you know, concern, areas of concern as it relates to recruiting going forward in 2022. So, but I guess by not understanding what employees are running from or what they're gravitating toward when they're leaving, I think leaders can really be putting their organizations at risk. And I think the most common example that we see is pay increases as a kind of quick fix to a problem in terms of the great resignation. So I don't necessarily think that that's always the solution because it may not be exactly what that employee is looking for. I think there has been a lot of media discussion and just media in general around um, employees dissatisfaction with wages as being a primary reason, but I do think that there are a lot of other um, reasons that we can kind of dig into a little bit more as we you know, talk about the current labor market. 
So the top reasons that we are seeing and that studies have shown that people are leaving are due to toxic work environments. They want to restore work-life balance. So, you know, people are really putting their own well-being first. Uh, so they're really just re-envisioning, you know, what that work-life balance looks like for them. And then also burnout, exhaustion, and grieving. Also response to COVID and also just having a lack of connection with their organization or their immediate team. So like I said, I think that employees are really, um, you know, putting their own well-being first. And I think as an HR professional or a recruiter or a leader within an organization, I think that, you know, we really need to continue to address the well-being of our employees and our staff and just really continuing to adapt to that change. I think the pandemic has really just continued to remind us that we really can't stop change right now, especially within the workforce, um, and that we're going to continue to experience this type of change. So I think in order to adapt to that change, we really need strong leaders and managers and supervisors, you know, people and culture teams that are really building adaptive teams that have these types of skills. And these are the kind of skills that really build adaptive teams. So skills like consistent communication, you know, within leadership, within teams, from really from the top down, um, value you know, individuals that value teamwork, interpersonal skills, strategic thinking, active listening, collaborative culture. These are really based on the reason why people are leaving. These are the things that, you know, leaders can really do um, to continue to adapt to that change. And I think, you know, especially pre-pandemic, there has been this notion that work from home can give you this balance um, but I just don't see that really being the case right now based on the data that we're seeing in terms of why people are leaving, because they're still leaving due to culture, due to environment, um, and that, that's still happening, you know, even in a primarily remote uh, workforce. So I think, you know, on that note, too, I think building a culture now is really looking different. So organizations are needing to adapt what remote cultures are, um, because it's really not just having a beer on tap. Um, it really needs to be, you know, a little bit more creative so that it's more inclusive of all employees, um, as opposed to, you know, uh, trying to, um, you know, really just be more attractive for you know, certain individuals, you know, in a more office environment. If I can add to that, Tracy, I think that adaptability, this notion of adaptability is extremely important just on, on my side of things as far as recruiting goes, kind of to harken back to what you mentioned as to why folks are leaving as part of the Great Resignation. We're seeing that employers that are not adapting to the inevitable changes the past couple of years has brought are the ones that are driving their employees away. I'm hearing from lots of potential employees that in some cases it is, my company is going back to the office. Um, in other cases, it's just, it's not always that particular example of going back to in-person, but it's companies are trying to return to how things were pre-pandemic and we can't just erase the last two years. Um, it's the employees, the employers that are going to take what has worked over the past two years along with what they kind of have missed out on beforehand and bringing that into a new, dynamic type of workplace and culture that I think will really um, push some employers forward as far as recruiting um, the top talent that we're experiencing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that the flexibility and efficiency can work side by side, but it's really, it's really being strategic around what that looks like for an organization. So I think, you know, after understanding why people are leaving organizations and, you know, how, how do you boost retention um, for what you actually have control over for the reasons that people are leaving? So, you know, for layoffs and restructuring, th those are really hard to reverse. Um, it's too late to fix poor responses to the pandemic. It's already been done. Toxic culture 
can't be changed overnight, but I think that there are some short-term fixes that can be done for organizations to really kind of help the overall morale and well-being of employees. Um, but also just understanding what elements of culture that can cause employees to leave and understanding those root issues that cause the to toxic culture. Um, I think that those you know, do need to be addressed. And if an organization has those core adaptive skills that we had talked about, I think that this is gonna continue to look different, but will also be easily adapted based on you know, how the market's gonna continue to change in the coming years. Um, so I think if we look at you know, reimagining our workforce, I think that you know, not all employees want to climb the corporate ladder. I think just a change of pace or an opportunity to try something new can really offer a fresh opportunity for the employee and really just keep them engaged um, you know, within the organization. It's a great way to be able to retain you know, current, current employees. Um, we talked about it a little bit, but adjusting the remote and office environments. Uh, some people might need a more predictable schedule with more boundaries, um, you know, because I just think right now, strictly remote isn't even a differentiator anymore in the market. So what else can we do to adjust that remote environment? Can you reduce hours? Maybe it's for a shorter period of time. I think it can get a little bit sticky as long, as long as you have guidelines around what that looks like. I think it can work really well, um, but I always like to be mindful of um, kind of how that, how that gets implemented. Uh, I also think that just doing company sponsored events, um, but adapting that and providing different type of events based on your population. Um, what, you know, different team building exercises, happy hours, activities, virtual events, just really keeping it light, but also understanding that happy hours, you know, isn't, it's not for everybody. So understanding your population, what are other things that you can do um, to be more inclusive? Um, I think about our, I know in our weekly calls here at MP, once a month, we do a community service highlight and it gives people the opportunity to share a community service that they're passionate about. They can volunteer within that organization and they share really why that's meaningful to them. And it really just sheds a different light on the person. It gives them an opportunity to be recognized for the community service that they've been doing. Um, but I think that it just, it's thinking about you know, the, the population and, and what motivates your population and how can you be creative, um, especially in a virtual environment. Um, the other thing I'll say, I think having a culture team or a, a connected committee or um, something like that can be really beneficial um, just as you're really looking to embrace employees' experience and really build a deeper connection with them. Um, and with your team and within the organization. So whether that's, you know, new employees coming on, if you have a Teams channel or a, a channel that you can introduce to the entire organization, um, you know, who they are, what they do, you know, their experience on both kind of a personal and professional level, um, highlighting current employees, um, just anything that you can do to really, um, you know, promote promote your employees and just learn a little bit more about them outside of work. Um, and then just one other thing that I didn't that I didn't add to this list that I'd probably want to recognize is just that, you know, organizations I've, I've seen too that this takes a little bit more time, but doing an internal survey and, you know, stay interviews, things like that, but any areas of concerns that that employees might have so that you can really understand your wor workforce and then be able to plan accordingly and build those types of programs that are that are more inclusive. If I can just add a couple of things there. So I'm glad when you were talking about uh, company sponsored social events, Tracy, you mentioned um, the kind of charitable aspect that that MP is involved in. That's something that works really important to us at Sentinel as well. And 
I know for a lot of folks, company sponsored social events might just equal happy hours. And while those have their own benefits, I think it's important to kind of look beyond those, especially as folks over the year 2020 might have gotten burned out from some of those. One thing that we did recently for Sentinel was for Valentine's Day, we made cards and homemade Valentine's, we encouraged employees to get their families involved and sent them to local nursing homes. And that was something that we had um, tables in each of our offices where folks could get together and work on them in person. But we also gave remote employees across the country an opportunity to be a part of that as well. And it was truly an event that everyone could be a part of regardless of where they were physically. Yeah. And then one other piece just on the first action, reimagining your workforce. While I think it's imperative that we continue to look for talent outside of the organization, I, I truly believe that it's equally as important to nurture the talent that we have because they're not guaranteed to stay, especially in such an environment. So I think the notion of lateral career opportunities, building opportunities for professional and personal development from your current employees, I'm a great example of that. I actually started out at Sentinel in the, on the marketing team and I made the move to people and culture because I truly do believe that Sentinel has created a culture and an environment that really encourages people to find their correct path. And if you are a great employee, I would imagine many folks on this call would feel that way. You would rather have an employee find their right path and their right position within your organization than find that position at a different one. So I think really putting an emphasis on the employees that you currently have, as well as finding additional talent from outside the organization can be equally as important. Yeah, absolutely. It's a win-win for everybody, mm -hmm. right? So. Yeah, so this is something now that I I talk about a lot, um, just kind of moving away from the mentality of hire and retain and thinking about it more in a track, in a way of attract and provide instead. Um, so I think that, you know, we've, we've covered the current landscape, what it looks like. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about, you know, more specific when it comes to recruiting. So I think that the roles of talent acquisition in HR has been continuously adapting and changing to meet the needs of employees. And I think Lisa and I just had a similar conversation around that and the way that they're really kind of building out their people and culture team instead of, you know, they're not, they're not a compliant, they're not just for compliance, HR compliance, they're really um, promoting their people. Um, and again, with that, we're putting, you know, the employees overall well-being first. So I think it's a, it's an obligation to really make a shift from that traditional mentality with, you know, recruiting on the attracting piece and then HR when it comes to really providing um, and really kind of working together to build that out. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the idea of people teams is, is really to truly value the people and the employees that work there. And by doing that, they're providing with them with the resources to be successful. And, you know, just as Lisa, Lisa shared with her experience, that's ultimately, you know, going to be more beneficial for the organization. It's going to help with revenue in a lot of cases. You're going to continue to be an employer of choice. And Lisa is probably getting a lot of emails on LinkedIn. And I'm sure that people are reaching out to her. But there's really no reason for her to answer those messages because she there's no reason for her to leave at this point because she feels valued. She was able to take her career in a different direction where she wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, so I think that's really where you start to see top employers being really successful because they're giving them those tools and resources to be able to be successful. So from here, we'll talk a little bit more about how companies and leaders can really focus on recruiting with a people first mentality and really kind of attract the best candidates in, in this very, very competitive um, job market right now. So as we look at best practices for 2022 recruiting success, um, I always kind of ask the questions, do you, do you have a plan in place or is it you know, a little bit more ad hoc, go with the flow? Um, what are you offering to provide for the candidates? And then also 
very, very important. How are you communicating and staying engaged with candidates? Because, the, you know, it's just, it's moving quickly. Um, so it's really, really important to, to stay engaged. Um, so do you have a plan in place? So, you know, is the, are, is the position remote, hybrid, or office? I think this is where it can get really messy um, because you really, we've learned that the blur, having blurred lines can really cause some internal inequities and just some internal issues between departments or teams. So just making sure that, you know, you have really defined policies and guidelines around those expectations because, you know, a work from anywhere mentality really isn't always the case if it's remote. And there's a lot of compliance implication as it relates to where you're physically working to. So one of the things that, you know, we've implemented and I know some other organizations have is a hub strategy. So we have shifted our workforce to primarily being remote where pre-pandemic we were not. Um, but as we're building out these teams, we're building out a remote hub strategy. So we have certain locations where, you know, we are hiring people remotely. However, ideally they'll be in and around a certain area. So that way, you know, when we are back to normal that, you know, we're able to get together, we can have company sponsored events or if do team meetings in person, leadership can travel to those different locations. It makes things like that a little bit more manageable um, and it gives them a little bit more of a community, um, you know, by having that hub strategy. And I can also, I know of a couple of companies that I've heard in talking with candidates where um, some offices are being required to go back to work. Um, if you were previously in this, that specific office, you're required to go back to work, but then other offices that have shut down um, are not able, they're, they're able to stay home. So that's causing a lot of internal issues where, you know, there really isn't necessarily a business reason outside of the fact that that office opened up again, that they really need to be in the office. It, it has proven that they've been just as, as successful at home. So that's where I think the, the you know, remote, um, you know, remote option can be both a benefit, but it can also just get really, really messy internally. Um, and then as we look at employer branding, you know, what does your web presence look like from, from a recruiting perspective? You know, are you, you know, updating your Glassdoor website, Indeed, LinkedIn? You know, those are just really important to make sure that the branding is consistent. Are your job boards posted across all of them? You know, a lot of small or mid-sized companies don't necessarily have a full recruiting or large HR team that, you know, they have the capacity to kind of manage that. Um, but I think from a, you know, a marketing perspective, from a candidate experience perspective, it's really important um, to make sure that those are updated. And then as it relates to Glassdoor, um, obviously, I think everybody kind of takes it with a grain of salt, but I think one of the things that, um, you know, an employer can do is, you know, is really just is still respond to those bad reviews in a tone that isn't defensive and you're thanking the reviewer for their feedback. I think it also just really lets, you know, candidates know that their voices are heard um, because people want to feel heard, especially if they have a bad experience, they want to feel heard, they want, you know, they want that support on that end. Um, and then from a social media and branding perspective too, just, you know, congratulating like team members promotions um, publicly on LinkedIn or, you know, really just celebrating, you know, company milestones, things like that. I think, you know, it's really free marketing and you're promoting an organization that you're proud to work for. So it really goes a long way. Um, as we look at, you know, employer branding. And then there's still a diminishing quality of direct applicants across the board. That's really no surprise. The post and coast mentality is really just a thing of the past right now. Um, but I think that there are things that employers can do to increase their candidate pools, you know, by marketing and, you know, building a strong culture and really marketing that strong culture. 
Um, the other thing that is actually not on this list, but um, job description creation. I think that that is um, a big miss on a lot of people here and on a lot of, in a lot of conversations that I'm having because the job descriptions just have too many requirements. They're too long. You know, candidates aren't going to be reading through it. You know, the, the, the purpose of posting at this point, the way the market is, is we just want to get candidates in the door. We want to get them in our applicant tracking system. They might not be perfect for that job, but, you know, we want to promote people to be coming to our site and applying for jobs. Um, so I think really focusing on, you know, what the candidate is expected to accomplish versus what all the requirements are that are needed. Because I think sometimes there are some non-traditional experiences, such as Lisa, who came from marketing, moved into HR, that, you know, she can still be successful in that HR role. So um, I think that that is really important. I could add to just as if you're looking at it from an employer branding perspective, the last bullet showcasing your culture, mission and values. I would encourage everyone on this call to listen to your employees and listen to the candidates that you're speaking to. Whenever I am conducting phone interviews, one of the first questions I ask, it's a very standard one, but what interested you in applying for the company? Often we'll get the, I was just applying to a bunch of different jobs. And while I appreciate the transparency and the honesty, a lot of times I'll get quality answers like, well, I saw this on your website and that was really important to me. I'm always taking notes of things like that. If there are certain benefits or certain aspects of your company that you're hearing from your employees that they appreciate, figure out ways to really push those and really make those available and make candidates aware of those. Because if it's something that's important to your current employees, it will likely be an attractive piece to prospective employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other thing too, is it relates to, um, job descriptions um, in applications is that keep the application process as simple as possible. Start it with a quick apply. Um, you know, if you can make that application in one to two minutes, you're, you know, you're in good shape because you're going to get more candidates because there's such a drop-off rate at that point. And I think the previous mentality was if they're really interested in us, we'll get the cover letter, we'll get the application, we'll, you know, we'll get everything that we need. But I think right now, just being in a candidate market, um, you know, that's, that's just not the case anymore. So as quick as you can, um, you know, from an application standpoint. Um, so then what are you offering to provide for candidates? So these conversations are happening a lot quicker now it's not a red flag for somebody to ask for a remote position or to ask for flexibility. I think pre-pandemic, those were all, those could very much be perceived as, um, as red flags. But um, I think that what, in terms of benefits, I think that this is really important because people want to know why they should take this job over the other three offers that they have. So, you know, what can you differentiate from a um, from a benefits perspective. So stipends for gyms or wellness programs. Um, one thing that I've seen recently that I think is awesome is that um, companies have covered pediatric sleep consultant um, coverage. So, you know, once a year, they have access to work with a pediatric or even adult sleep consultant, because I think at the end of the day, again, it's the well-being of the employee and their families that will make them more successful. So it's something that is very inexpensive in the grand scheme of things for an organization, but it can really, really go a long way and really show parents or people that their sleep matters, that their children's sleep matters. And it really just makes them a better employee too. And it, it's, it really goes a long way. So um, on that, you know, also potentially having a return to work program, for new parents, professional development, um, any expense meals or, you know, anything that you can do to really make them feel connected um, to the organization or the team. Another one I'd like to add is, um, as we're thinking about employees' well-being, employees' mental health, obviously mental health programs are really important. Kind of adding on to that, something that we've seen at Sentinel that's been very successful is financial wellness and financial literacy program. There's been studies that have shown how um, financial wellness and awareness and mental health and awareness are, are linked. And so any kind of education or resources you can provide your employees to lessen their stress when they log off of work for the night is, is really, really important. 
Um, paid family leave is a big, big word in that word cloud. That's been top of mind with a lot of different legislation that's been passed or not passed. Um, at Sentinel, we do have a generous paid family leave program, and that is something that we advertise because it's a, it's a, not to kind of trivialize that important benefit as a selling point, but it is something for us, especially when we're seeing that there's some states, some companies that aren't able to offer that. So if there are benefits like that that differentiate you from other employee employers, definitely be sure to really put those front and center. Yeah. And I think from a diversity and inclusion perspective too, um, I think that there are a lot of benefits that employers can can think about as it relates to work arrangements. So making positions more accessible to candidates that wouldn't otherwise maybe be able to be in an office, um, gender affirmation, paid leave as well, um, promoting affinity or employee resources groups, you know, on your careers page, things like that. Anything that you can do to really um, promote, you know, your, your organization, I think um, in, in, as candidates are looking at those benefits, it's, it's really, really important. So uh, the last thing I think from a recruiting perspective too, that um, is really important is understanding or, or knowing how to pronounce a candidate's name when you're calling them. I think not only is it a, a common courtesy to, to pronounce their name, but I think it really just shows a behavior of inclusivity within the organization. It really just creates a culture of belonging. So, you know, it's a, it's a quick Google search if you're not sure. Um, I know, you know, personally, I have a lot of people with my daughter's name. They have a hard time pronouncing it even after I tell them a couple of times. Um, so I think I just think it's really, really important, um, you know, to, to do that. So then in terms of um, in terms of staying engaged, so, you know, some of this seems pretty straightforward or obvious, but, you know, having a clear and concise process in, in maintaining transparency, um, using a booking tool. Um, a lot of people still actually aren't using booking tools, but I think it's, it's easy. It's, there's plenty of free ones out there. Um, and it really allows candidates to be able to work around their schedule as well. If you can do some after hours or early morning phone interviews, things like that, keep your calendar open to be able to do that because I think it, it's, it's really helpful. Um, and then, you know, communication and engagement. Just go the extra mile, stand out. We'll talk about some ways that you can do that. And then also the power of, the, of a professional rejection. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but I just, I think with all of this in terms of keeping them engaged, it's, there's just really a need for speed right now across the board and as it relates to hiring. So, but you also wanna make sure you're hiring the, the right people too. So, you know, our kind of rule of thumb internally is, a, is replying to an application within 24 hours. And I know that that can be really difficult with you know, meeting other demands of your jobs, but I think you know, strike while the iron's hot because it's, it's really, really important um, to, to move quickly because they're applying to many other jobs um, if, they're, if they're out there. Um, so just again, kind of having those steps between the steps um, when you're, uh, when you're you know, bringing them through the process. So maybe there's a, a few days between an interview, can you send them a, a culture video um, or you know, something that you can send them just as a you know, step in between so that they know that you know, they're still, you know, you're still really engaged. Um, and I've talked to some people about this, but um, some people that have been in hospitality and, um, and move toward recruiting in HR, but you know, bring a hospitality and customer service mindset to your hiring. So we can't, you know, right now we can't necessarily bring candidates into the office in a lot of cases um, to really get a, you know, a sense of, you know, and a feel for the organization, you know, meet people and things like that. But by, pro by providing those culture videos, I think it really gives them um, that, that opportunity. Another thing that I've seen that I think is it could be really helpful and it's not something as short term, but having a net promoter score for candidates um, for, feed, for feedback tools that you can use, um, whether they were hired or not hired. I mean, even reaching out to candidates that you know, gave you a poor score and finding out, okay, how can we make this better? I think it also just shows that candidate that, again, feedback is value and that they feel heard. 
Um, and then going back to relating it to hospitality again, I mean, I think it's just about taking care of your team or your hiring managers, and then also taking care of your guests or your the candidates that um, that you're working with. Because by doing this, whether they get the job or not, um, it really just gives them an experience that makes them want to come back. Um, you know, when they're when they're looking at you know their job search. So um, the last thing with the power of a professional rejection. I mean, we can't hire everybody, unfortunately, and everybody isn't always a great fit for the role. Um, but I think that they, you know, being mindful of the, the quality of customer service that they get um, is very, very important because, again, it makes them, you know, wanting to come back for more. I think communication with hiring managers is, is key in that, in that whole last um, slide because, I'm sure that many folks in this call, your recruiting and interviewing process has changed. And it's important to make hiring managers aware of that. Both so you can provide a consistent candidate experience um, for when they speak with you or someone on your team, then when they move through that hiring manager and the next kind of maybe rounds of interviews. And also just kind of making them, I'm sure as, as the majority of us are HR professionals, we're all aware of kind of what the talent pool is looking like right now, what the job market is looking at right now. Some of your hiring managers in different departments may not be as up to date on that. So kind of maybe expressing the urgency to them because they might not seem, uh, they might not feel the need to get back to a candidate as quickly as you know that has yeah. to be done. So making sure that they're aware of kind of how the process has evolved and making sure they're providing an equitable candidate experience in the same way you are is, is gonna be really important. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think too, um, as far as a candidate experience too, um, in recruiting, I think that there's a, real balancing act between technology and then personal connection. So we'll get more into the kind of creating a strong recruiting tech stack later in the conversation, but understanding where technology can and should replace a phone call, but then when can a phone call replace technology is really crucial as we look at the candidate experience. So I think of, um, you know, if a candidate spent hours or a full day in an interview or created a presentation for an interview or traveled to just to get a generic email that they didn't get the job is just really poor customer service. And it doesn't make them want to come back for more when there's other opportunities. So but I think that if a candidate, you know, is rejected from a, a phone screen, I, I don't necessarily think that candidate needs a phone call to be told that they're not considered. But as long as the candidate communication and transparency is there, that the next steps you will receive an email, I, I think that in those situations, it's okay because it really as recruiters right now, we wouldn't be able to follow up with every person that we talk to. Um, but I think just any, any, some communication even after that, I think is, is really, really important. So as we look at attracting uh, candidates right now, I think we need to really differentiate the interview process. Again, share culture benefits, um, culture and benefits, provide details for the interviewer to really set them up to be successful. You know, sending a swag, a welcome box. We had talked about the hub strategy as well, um, but really just kind of getting them excited um, because they're still getting emails, they're still getting messages. You know, you don't want them to continue to answer those messages. So continue to pro provide those steps between the steps. One of the things, actually, there was a, a few weeks between um, me leaving my last job and, and coming here. And one of the things that my manager at MP did was he just set up a 30 minute um, touch base where we were able to just chat. It was pretty informal. Um, he kind of got to give me a little bit more of, you know, a lay of the land. Um, but it really just gave me the opportunity to, to kind of ask more questions and it just showed his continued general uh, just interest in my candidacy for the position. So um, I think that, that that really went a long way. So um, for the employers or the hiring managers, I think providing you know, consistent processes internally. So Outlook invites, providing screening details, interview timeline, assessments, you know, things like that, any type of behavioral based interview questions. Um, I think that all that is, is very, very uh, helpful. That's a great example that you shared, Tracy. And I think that that's vital as well. And we've talked most of this webinar about attracting potential candidates, but I think it's also important to remember a quote that I heard once that it always sticks with me is 
the onboarding process begins the moment the job offer is signed. So also go to go along with that, the job offer being signed does not mean always that you have that candidate, especially in this current job market. We've had folks that have signed job offers and then gone back on them before their start date. So I think just those touch points, like what your manager at MP did and just keeping up that excitement level that you're really excited for the person to start, keeping a constant stream of communication with them between the moment they sign their offer and when they actually start and you begin kind of the, the socialization process is um, can be really beneficial and just make them feel all the more valued as a member of the team. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, though we, we had talked a little bit just about how to attract the candidates, but at the same time, you know, what, what are we going to be able to do to, you know, provide for them throughout the hiring and onboarding process? So I think for the candidate, it's just setting realistic timelines for, you know, for both the candidate, but also the hiring manager too. But, you know, I always recommend to over communicate versus under communicate. You, know, you want to know what else, you know, they have in, in the, you know, hopper as it relates to other positions, things like that, so that, you know, you don't, you don't get blindsided either. Um, but, but as much communication as you can throughout that process. And then I think for the hiring managers, it's also just setting a timeline for feedback. Again, I think, I know it can be difficult to get feedback sometimes from hiring managers, but, you know, set, set the timeline for that feedback, um, schedule a 10 minute debrief if you need to, you know, I know internally, sometimes for certain positions, we do summit calls where, you know, after the interviews, have taken place, everybody that has interviewed that candidate, we do a 15 minute summit call to go over um, the feedback for that candidate. And I think it, it's just, it's really, really helpful to really keep things moving um, for, you know, for the candidate so that we don't lose good talent. Um, and then I think too, just providing interview kits as it relates to the hiring managers or different structured interview schedules that you can provide. So I think Sometimes this can feel like it's a little bit more work for them, but I think actually it's it's taking some of the guesswork out of it for them by giving them basically the manual of like, this is what we need in the interview. Um, so it really gives them the tools to be able to be, you know, to hire faster and more efficiently. And I think the other thing with doing that um, is that it can provide consistent measure of determining what you're actually looking for um, and having that structure can also mitigate any biases that may be able, that may come up, you know, within the hiring process. So you're staying really consistent across the board. And I think that just the, the benefit outside of, you know, it being more consistent is that over time, if there's any question that isn't necessarily generating an intended outcome, you can always adapt to that and, and update it and change it so that you're getting the intended outcome based on the interview questions that you're asking. Um, so I think over time and, you know, by doing that, you'll be able to have that um, consistent, you know, feedback from that structure. Um, and it, you know, again, it's just that those ad hoc interviewing, I think you're just at risk of, of losing time because I think that um, it, it's not as effective if you, if you don't have a, a real kind of structure around that process. And then as we talk about tech staff, um, I think that this really depends on the size of your organization. It's usually a little bit of a different conversation depending on what your structure looks like. Are you a small organization? Are you a large organization? If you're a large organization, you probably have most of, you know, most of the, you know, traditional kind of tech stack that, that an organization would need. Um, but as far as a tech stack, um, you know, what, what areas can you automate within your processes with technology to make it more efficient? So, you know, whether it's using video tools or virtual hiring events, building templates in your ATS, if you don't have an ATS, building a template even just in your email can be beneficial. It saves you time. Um, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel for each position that you're working on. Um, and then building different templates within your booking tools. Um, and then, you know, an employee referral program, any way that you can automate and get in front of candidates with an employee referral program is really, really beneficial because it not only helps with referrals and employee branding, 
but it gives current employees the opportunity to see what is open because most employees are not going directly to their, you know, website to see what's open. So um, I think that that's really important. Also reference tools. Um, I think for the most part, that's usually more of a, a luxury or used for larger organizations, but any other type of assessment tools too that, that you can use to really, you know, determine whether or not, you know, that candidate would be a good, a good long-term fit, um, you know, based on, based on their assessments. And the assessment tools could be skill-based or personality or cognitive, you know, what it, it depends on really what, what those positions are. And again, I think it really depends on, you know, industry too, um, you know, what, what you would want to determine to adapt within your tech stack. I'm glad you mentioned employer referral programs, because I think that's really important as well, both to um, expand your talent pool, but also kind of hearkening back to the upskilling and putting focus on your current people as well. Letting folks know about the current openings you have in case they'd like to refer anyone can also help anyone that's currently at your company that may be thinking about a, a career move or a lateral move, make them more aware of, um, of what you have available for openings as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the more that you can automate that, the better. Um, a lot of ATSs will, will have that function as part of the function of, of the tool. So if, if you don't have that within your ATS, take a look and see, because you might not just be utilizing it, but it's a really great opportunity to, to get in front of um, your candidates. I know internally what we have is um, every Monday, our ATS will automatically send to all of the employees um, our openings that, that we choose to, to be um, included in that email, um, but it allows employees to directly you know, uh, post it onto LinkedIn or email or any of the other social accounts, and then it can track those employee referrals based, you know, directly through the ATS. So it's definitely a fun way too, to like put some, uh, to put some little contests in place, not even just for hiring people, but, you know, who shared it the most, things like that. Uh, I think that those, those really go a long way and just add a little bit of uh, fun, whether you give an Amazon gift card or whatever, whatever it is, just just something little um, to give them a little something extra for for helping. And then also as it relates to tech stack, this is um, kind of more HR in general focus, but um, you know, understanding that obviously recruiting tech stack is important, but also you know having a internal um, or an HCM system that can really function as a hire to retire resource. If you're looking to scale, I highly recommend, you know, looking at different ways that you can, you know, just have one central database because I think it does make things a lot easier. I think if you start to piecemeal with different um, systems, it can really start to get messy. So the more that they can talk, and I know just based on it being, you know, mostly HR professionals on this, um, most people probably have one, but if you are a smaller organization um, or, you know, think that you'll have significant growth in the, in the coming months or years, it's definitely something that would, would set your organization um, up for success to be able to scale. And then just as far as, you know, my role here at MP and kind of who we are, what we do. So I, I lead our recruiting process outsourcing team here. And, and basically what we do, it's a little bit of a, a different um, function than what most people are familiar with, but um, we really work kind of as a, a function of your HR team. So we partner with internal HR and recruiting teams um, to be able to help meet their demands. So sometimes that's with, you know, companies that don't have any applicant tracking system and they're not quite at a size that they're in a position to, you know, bring on an ATS or different sourcing tools. So, you know, the work with our team and, you know, we have those resources that we're able to use on, on their behalf. And that is all I have for today. Um, but if anybody has any questions for me at all, feel free to reach out. This is my contact information. I'm happy to set up a quick call or meeting um, if anybody has an interest in, in connecting. 
And if anybody has any questions in the chat, we're happy to, to stay on for a couple minutes and answer any questions that, that you might have. We did get a couple in that I'm just going through right now. So a couple of questions related to ATSs. Um, someone asked, what is an ATS? So great question. That stands for Applicant Tracking System. It's a place to collect all of your different job applications. Um, someone else asked what ATS we use. I know at Sentinel, we use Jazz HR. They have a lot of integrations with, with Zoom. They allow us to quickly send links for employee referrals. We can move candidates from job to job if we find that they may be a better fit for a different position. We can set up assessments for interviewers to fill out after the interviews are over. Um, that's what we use for our applicant tracking system or ATS. Tracy, I'm not sure um, on your end, but there's quite a few yes. out there. Jazz HR is just the one that we use at Sentinel. Yeah, so we use iSolve Hire. Um, that's part of our full HCM suite of services. So we use iSolve Hire. And I think it's a I think it's a great, a great resource. It's it's pretty simple, simple to use, um, user friendly as it relates to reports, things like that. I think the other question I get a lot too um, is, you know, what if for a small recruiting team, what's kind of the first thing, or maybe you don't have a recruiting team, because a lot of times, you know. HR might be recruiting or there might be, you know, an administrative, administrative person. I think the, the best kind of bang for your buck as you're looking at outreach and recruiting and getting something set up really is an applicant tracking system, because I think that it really saves people a lot of time um, and it gives you a lot more outreach because there's so many companies that, that we meet with that are, you know, still paying on Indeed for all of their postings and then they're only coming in through Indeed or you know, other avenues where you know, it's a central database to house everything. And there's some pretty simple ones out there like actually Jazz and iSolve, which I've used both. They're, they're really just good user-friendly types of ATSs that allow, um, that allow you to get that outreach and have a central hub. A lot of them have career page options as well to really make a more dynamic career page to promote that employer brand that we were talking about, whether mm -hmm. it's through um, career path examples or culture videos, images, that's all baked in as part of a lot of those applicant tracking systems. Yeah, absolutely. Not seeing any other questions come in, Tracy, I don't know if you see any. I don't. Well, if I'll start, I'll start to wrap up unless we get any last minute questions in, but um, I really just want to take the time to thank everyone for joining us today. Tracy, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I found this really helpful. I'm feeling really energized to go do some more, some more quality recruiting and really promote our employer brand. As a reminder, as Nick mentioned at the top of the webinar, the slides as well as this presentation recording will be emailed out to everybody. Also encourage you to visit the events page on Sentinel's website for upcoming events. One that may be of note to many HR professionals on the call today is actually tomorrow morning. We have our quarterly HR roundtable. Um, that's for HR professionals to get together in a very informal setting, chat about different concerns, issues, bounce ideas off of one another. It's always a really engaging conversation.